Yeah, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. You will notice shortly I forgot my throat back at the reception I was at last night at the meeting in Seattle. I spent too much time arguing with some crotchety old alumni from my department. I hope there aren't any of you here. So what, what makes me qualified to present a talk like this? I'm a, I'm a geophysicist. <clears throat> I'm a geophysicist, and uh, I was a Jefferson Science Fellow at USAID in the State Department during the academic year 2009 and 2010. So I was there when the Haiti earthquake happened. My earthquake knowledge came into play to help them understand what earthquakes are, aftershocks, things like that. And I was able to see the humanitarian side of it from the inside, from the side of the State Department and the Agency for International Development, which is a fairly unusual thing. I started giving talks to State Department and AID people about the science of the earthquake, and I started giving talks to scientists about the humanitarian side of the earthquake. So IRIS, the Incorporated Research Institutes for Seismology, and the Seismological Society of America asked me to become a distinguished lecturer, if they didn't know I'd lose my voice, uh, for the past year on the combination of the scientific and humanitarian sides of the Haiti earthquake. Then after the Japan earthquake, I was asked to add that. Special for you tonight, I've added some Cascadia things as well. So, okay, a little warning then. Because I kept adding that stuff, the talk is an hour long, just to warn you. Okay, so here we go. So the Haiti earthquake, the figure here is showing the three months of earthquake activity prior to the earthquake that occurred in Haiti. Uh, you see details of it there. The trivia questions already outline some of that. Um, and you'll notice, of course, that the earthquakes occur in areas that, um, in specific areas. They don't occur just any old place. And there you see the Haiti earthquake and its aftershocks. Uh, if we were to start looking at these earthquake occurrences over a longer time period, you would really notice that they occur along specific zones. Of course, these are fault lines and, and major plate boundaries, as we know. And you see them here. Now, it doesn't take a geologist to recognize that, yeah, the earthquakes occur on specific spots. And in the interior of those spots, we call that plates, um, there is very little deformation, very little earthquake activity. The Haiti earthquake itself occurred there. And a little bit of geography. This is the island of Hispaniola. And the western side of it is Haiti. The eastern side is the Dominican Republic. Uh, a little bit more regional geology. Again, if you look at a bathymetric map <coughs> of the area, from Google Earth in this case, uh, you can see that it would be fairly easy to draw the major plate boundaries. And if, I, if you hadn't had too much beer yet tonight, you would have drawn them much like that. And then you would start noticing some complicated areas when you look at earthquake activity. And you might draw some minor plate boundaries like these and northern South America and southern uh, Central America. And then it becomes clear that the area <coughs> of Hispaniola up in there, the convergence between the plates is not parallel and it's not perpendicular. Now, many of you got the questions right about transform fault or subduction zone. And this area doesn't fit very neatly into either of those. It's a combination of them. So Mother Nature doesn't like that. Mother Nature wants to separate that into areas that slide sideways against each other and areas that converge together directly. So it ended up splitting that area into little slivers. They could be called microplates. Some people call them that. And the motion got separated such that the perpendicular, the convergence part of that between North America and the Caribbean occurred there in an area we could call the Puerto Rico Trench. And the strike slip or transform motion, and that's why the answer was transform fault for the Haiti earthquake, occurred there, slipping that way. So it resolved it into that. We're going to take a look from this direction on the next slide. It will be a, uh, uh, a sort of like an aerial image but made up from computer imagery of that. And there you have that part of Hispaniola. There's a southern peninsula that sticks out there. And uh, I'm going to ask you, I can sort of see you through the bright lights here, how many of you think you can identify where the major fault plane is that the earthquake occurred on? Some of you probably can. OK. I'm going to put it on there. 
and there you see it. And now I'm going to take that, I'm going to take that red line off. And it's really obvious there, isn't it now? There's no trick played. Now, now, your next question should be, why do we pay geologists the big dollars that we do? Because it's pretty obvious. <laughs> OK. So anyway, that's the fault. It's called the Enriquillo or Enriquillo Plantain Garden Fault. Now, I, 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 I drew upon my favorite draftsman, the New York Times, for this figure here. And it just shows the combination of the Enriquillo Plantain Garden Fault there the Septentrional Fault, which I'll just refer to sometimes as the fault in the north or the northern fault. Uh, and then uh, offshore of that is the uh, uh, Puerto Rico Trench where the oblique motion goes. And uh, you see a cross section through there showing how it's sort of split up with the subduction and then the transform energy there. Now let's take a look at the history here. This is a map showing the history of large earthquakes in Haiti and, well, all the way to the Puerto Rico. And uh, the history isn't very well known. Uh, in the 1700s, it would be known from records kept by ship's captains uh, at harbor. Uh, there wasn't much in the, other, uh, in the way of written record otherwise. Uh, but you see all those earthquakes that occurred in, in uh, Hispaniola, or particularly in Haiti, and they're all pretty long time ago. So nobody living now, or even their immediate ancestors, would have experienced any of those earthquakes. Here we see a sequence of earthquakes that occurred in the 1700s. There was an earthquake in 1751, followed very quickly by another earthquake in 1751, and then one in 1770. These other ones that are sort of greenish occurred on probably different faults, not the same one. This is something that caused all seismologists a bit of concern. The seismological community knew about these earthquakes. And then when the magnitude 7 occurred and killed so many people, we were pretty much terrified that there would be other earthquakes following it on neighboring zones of the fault. Uh, we only have this one sequence of historic earthquakes to go by, and it took about 20 years for that to play itself out. We don't know if the current earthquake, uh, the, if the recent earthquake is part of a current series like this or not. We just don't have enough of a historic record. So none of the Haitians alive in Haiti today would have had any recollection of earthquake activity. And the historic record is weak, and the education of that is not very good. So let's take a look, though, at the larger scale of things and see how this relates to other earthquakes around the world. First, I think you probably all know that the Earth is divided into several large, fairly rigid plates, and most of the deformation occurs on their boundaries. Now, the Haiti earthquake occurred there, as you can see, the Caribbean-North America boundary. A little bit later, the Chile earthquake occurred, as you see here, and that was a subduction zone earthquake in Chile, and it was much, much larger than the Haitian earthquake. There were also earthquakes in Christchurch, New Zealand, and then the big earthquake in Japan. Now, just seeing this little sequence here, you could easily start imagining that, wow, maybe there's something going on, and of course, conspiracy theorist type people in, on the internet saw all sorts of, they could read everything into this. It's quite fascinating. Uh, but it is, uh, we'll come back to this question later on. Is there an increase in activity around the world or is there not toward the end of the talk? But the Japan earthquake is the other one we're going to talk about today. And you see it over there. Now, it occurs on a funny plate boundary, essentially the Pacific plate with regard against the North American plate. Now you'd say a North American plate over there, well, that's kind of silly. You can see this map here shows how it's connected. We'll also take a look at it from, from a northern hemisphere point of view, and you can see how, well, okay, it kind of makes sense that North America will come down to that part of Japan. Um, it's a little bit of semantics as to whether it's the North American plate or some microplate that's there, but it turns out it is. It just confuses us always to think of it that way. But the earthquake occurred there <coughs> on that plate boundary. And it had an unusual aspect to it. Uh, this is a, a time dates on this side here. So it's March 9th, March 11th, March 13th, and so on going in this direction. And uh, magnitude on the other side. And you see that the we first had a magnitude 7.3 followed by a few aftershocks of it. Now, we, 
everybody figured that was the big earthquake and these were the aftershocks. Nobody knew that that was a foreshock to the magnitude 9 earthquake to follow and its aftershock sequence. Now, just a little bit, can seismologists ever really know in advance, well, can they recognize if something is a foreshock and expect a main shock to occur later? No, we cannot. We don't know. We don't know until a main shock occurs. Then we reclassify what we thought was the main shock into a foreshock. And my own personal history bears that out. I was in southern Mexico trying to locate aftershocks of a magnitude 5 earthquake, 5.5, to use those as, as sources of energy to profile the crust of the earth in southern Mexico. This is about 100 years ago. And uh, <laughs> Uh, so we were getting closer and closer to where the aftershocks were. We were right there. We had our seismograph stations right on top when the main shock occurred, and it was magnitude 7.7. .7. So even seismologists can walk into danger not having a clue that it's a foreshock sequence. A little bit more interesting story there. The villagers thought that we were in the area because we knew the big earthquake was about to happen, <laughs> and, and we didn't tell them. So. <laughs> It's as close to a lynching as I've ever been. <laughs> so. You see here is some information about the Japan earthquake. It was huge, and it occupied the area that you see there, more or less in, in pink or whatever that color is, uh, and the aftershock sequence that followed it there. And uh, from the trivia questions, you knew that it was a subduction zone earthquake. So here's a cross-section through the Japan subduction zone, and up there at the top, part is where the thrusting takes place and the grinding of the two plates with respect to each other occurs there. And that type of earthquake, because it can occur over such a large area, that type can generate extremely large earthquakes. Uh, transform fault ones and so on probably don't generate earthquakes quite as big as subduction zones can. Now, we've gone through a little bit of the earthquakes leading up to the occurrence of the main shocks in both cases. Let's talk a minute about what is going on in society at large in trying to get ready for disasters like earthquakes. Well, the, the <clears throat> disaster community thought it had earthquakes and other disasters fairly well figured out until the Kobe earthquake in Japan occurred. Now, Japan is the best civilization in the world right now for earthquake preparedness. And the Kobe earthquake taught us that even they weren't quite ready. There were a lot of surprises that we learned then. And we're continuing to learn new things from each earthquake, because each earthquake presents new information that we have not had in the past. So the Kobe earthquake was a wake-up call to the seismological and the disaster community at large that we weren't ready. So a group got formed through the United Nations, and they met in Kobe, Japan, which happens to be in Hyogo Prefecture. Oh, boy. And uh, so the way that the UN does things, they name their things after the state where the, where the meeting was held to, to do this. So it's called the Hyogo Framework for Action. And they proposed that from 2005 to 2015, each country would sign on to this, and they have more countries than any of us can name have signed on to this, saying that they will get their communities ready to be resilient to disasters. Uh, and the approach is fairly straightforward. If you think about it much, it's kind of common sense, but then spelling out the details in that is a lot more work. And, and they got the group of experts together and they spelled out the details for that in a lot of publications. So we're, we're more than midway through that process. And everybody, I think, is behind schedule on what they promised they would do, but this was the intent. So most disaster reduction programs follow the advice of the Hyogo framework they just aren't following it as fast as they said they would. Let's take a look at how disaster risk reduction works. There are various ways to classify the stages of it. This is one way where we divide it into these four sections. The star here represents some event, a disaster. Could be an earthquake, could be a flood, could be a hurricane, could be a drought, could be a lot of different things. And when that happens, <clears throat> that's the effect itself. The immediate response after that is surprisingly called the response or the relief phase. That's when you go in and do something. You're saving lives, saving property, saving people from imminent uh, loss of life or property or limb or whatever. And that's the part that's really flashy. That's the part that hits the news a lot because there's a lot of photogenic stuff going on. 
uh, but it, in my opinion, it's not the most important part. And I think there are experts on disaster risk reduction in the audience here, and they'll probably agree with me that the most important part is elsewhere in this diagram. After the relief phase, you go into a period of <clears throat> recovery, and that's when you're sort of rebuilding, depending on how much damage was done. Uh, and so for the earthquake disasters that we've talked about, we're all in the recovery stage right now. They're still rebuilding. They're not back to normal, but they're no longer trying to save people and pull them out of buildings and, and, and keep things from falling down. The part at the top is the part that I would consider most important, mitigation. Mitigation is probably the least um, sexy of it all. It's the part that is sort of slogging along. It's like the dental floss part of taking care of your teeth. Um, it's you just got to do it. If you don't do it, you're in big trouble eventually. But it doesn't seem like it's important each time you do it. So that's mitigation, but it is probably the most important. Then there's an, and we'll talk about that uh, in a moment. I shouldn't have done that yet. I meant to go to preparedness. Preparedness means different things. It either means getting ready for something that you know is going to happen. For earthquakes, you can't do that. You don't know that that's about to happen. But for hurricanes, you see them coming, and you know they're about to happen, so you get ready for it. You board up the windows, you drive inland, whatever it is. For earthquakes, it means having things pre-positioned, having a, a plan in mind, how to do things. That's the preparedness stage for that. We're going to talk about mitigation next. <clears throat> And here you see that mitigation means to prevent the hazards. Now, haz <clears throat> hazards are what nature presents to us. There's nothing we can do about hazards. If there's going to be an earthquake, there's going to be an earthquake. Tough luck. But we can do something about vulnerability. How vulnerable are we? Right here, we're very vulnerable. It's, it's uh, sad to say. But uh, <laughs> so we can do something about that we could decide that we wanted to pass laws to retrofit buildings. Now, it would be very expensive to retrofit this building, but we could do that and reduce the vulnerability by a big earthquake would happen. The ground would still shake, but the building would not fall. So that's an example of that. The risk is what's important, and the risk is the vulnerability and the hazard. Some people will divide vulnerability into two different categories and stuff. We won't bother with that here. Now. How do scientists look at this? It turns out that scientists in general study nature, and, and I'm one of those. I'm a geophysicist, and some geophysicists study earthquakes. They're called seismologists. Um, so we try to learn how the earth works. As a result, we're pretty good at evaluating hazard. We have a pretty good idea what size earthquakes might be generated with what sort of frequency at different parts of the world good. Not real good, but pretty good. And, but of course, we've already seen that the hazard is only part of the problem. Risk is what's important, so the vulnerability is there. So should the scientists be involved with the risk, the, the vulnerability part of that? Well, in general, we've left that up to others, but is that really a good idea? And that's part of my talk today, or part of my slides. I'm not sure if my talking is working very well. So let's take a look at Haiti. <clears throat> this is a map that was the um, generally assumed to be sort of the best map for the earthquake hazard in Hispaniola before the earthquake. And you can see that this map presented the place where the earthquake did occur, right there, <clears throat> as being the lowest hazard area in the country. Well. Okay, I guess that shows that we really aren't all that good at it. It turns out that the seismologists all really understood this. They knew this map was not very good, but it's too complicated to try to make maps of every part of the world up to the best standard. Well, we realize now that we have to do that. We can't just say, well, yeah, this map ignores certain things that we know, but they did. The maps ignored that, and the rest of the world listened to the maps that we put out. They didn't necessarily listen to the papers we wrote because the papers we wrote were not intended for the rest of the world. Now, in this case, I've taken an example of a paper that I wrote in order to avoid offending my friends, because I want them to still buy beer for me occasionally. So uh, this is a paper I wrote in 1981. And if you were a land use planner trying to decide whether or not um, an earthquake hazard existed in a part of Colombia, South America, would you even find this paper? And if you did, would you even understand what it said? No, you wouldn't. So why did I write that paper? 
Well, I wrote that paper because like all scientists in academic environments, I'm trying to get the next research project funded. I'm trying to get tenure. I'm trying to get promoted. And this is how you do it. You write those types of papers. Now that's important because that's how we communicate to other scientists. But it turns out that this information then does not get used by the people who can improve the lot of the lives of the people in the area. And more and more people are realizing that that problem exists. More and more scientists are becoming more, shall we say, socially aware and socially active, and trying to make sure that their information is made available to the people who can use it. That's particularly true for the younger generation of scientists coming out these days. So that just says what I've said. If you were a land use planner or an architect, would you have found this paper? No, you wouldn't have. So the scientists, though, were understanding more and more about back to Haiti, the Haiti geology, Haitian environment, what sort of risk there was. And here you see detailed plate tectonic maps and detailed geologic maps of the Enriqueo Peninsula of, <coughs> of southwestern Haiti. And you can see that there's a fault running through there and some geologic units are offset by the fault. And, and this is an interesting thing. You could go to the fault in the field. Now this happens to be that northern fault where it is in Dominican Republic because the study was done there, not in Haiti, but it, it demonstrates this, uh, what can be done here. Uh, here you find, uh, this happens to be a satellite image made oblique from Earth, Google Earth, but you can see the fault running through there. So you find a place where the fault is running through a plain field and you go make a deal with the farmer and pay him for the crops you're going to ruin because you're going to dig up part of this fault. And so you trench right across that fault where it's very obvious and you carefully map the layers that you dig through in that trench. And you can see that some of those layers okay, are continuous, but there are a certain type of sand, and some of them actually seem to be connected with something down below. Now, deposition by itself doesn't occur that way. What happened here is that ground, <coughs> ground shaking occurred strong enough to make sand that was in deeper layers come up and erupt on the surface and spread out across the surface. That's the sort of thing that they're looking for, the disruption of this. Then they'll date it with carbon-14 and other methods and try to see what it is. Now, in the next slide, I'm going to go back to Japan. Japan earthquake was very interesting for quite a few reasons, but one of them is that millions of people had cell phones that could take videos in Japan. And so you could go to YouTube and find all sorts of fantastic examples of things happening there. And this is in a parking lot where people ran out, in, uh, not right at the earthquake area. This is not the earthquake fault itself, but there was subsidence and compaction, and so a crack occurred in the park. And this is surface waves going in and out. The, the earthquake waves passing through this area, 100 miles or so from the earthquake. And you see how geysers of water essentially coming up, spreading sand out across the surface of the parking lot. Well, it's that sort of feature that we look for in the geologic record to see, can we find this sort of stuff? And if we find it, and we find it in enough different places, and we can date it, and it's all at the same time, yes, a major earthquake happened at that time in this area. So that's the sort of thing to look for. Now, uh, people were also looking at uh, other aspects of Hispaniola, uh, both Haiti and the Dominican Republic, and one of them was GPS studies. So this is a model up in that corner showing how they thought parts of the Earth would be demonstrated as moving, given the faults and the plate tectonic motion in the area. And here you see various results that came from that, saying what areas seem to be locked and, and not allowing the stress to slip, and which areas then might have greater potential for large earthquakes. And it's hard to read this figure, but what it means is, yeah, the area around Port-au-Prince in Haiti was in, in pretty serious straits at that point. Now, the details of this are fairly interesting. You go and you take really good GPS measurements. Now, it's not the type of GPS we have on our phones to use find uh, near a Starbucks or something a lot fancier, a lot more precise, and they can measure down to a millimeter or less after they're sitting there recording for a day or a few days. And they go back day after day, uh, I mean, sorry, year after year, and make measurements for a few days, another few days, another few days. Uh, and they can see that the area is moving farther to the east and it's moving farther to the north and it's going up or down a little bit too. Uh, and 
as a result of that. Now, it takes a person going and making these measurements at various sites in the country. And I want to make a point here with this picture. It's become more and more important, and more scientists have recognized this, that they can't just go and do what we might call parachute science, where we just come into a country, do some work, and leave. More and more scientists realize they have to partner with the scientific and technical community in the country and work with them. Because in the long run, what's really important is for them to be able to do it themselves in the near future as well. And so that's what we see here is a Haitian operating the instrumentation. Now, the results of this GPS study is that you see all those little arrows there. Uh, that shows the rate at which different parts of the land are moving. And you see the arrows are bigger here. And they're smaller there and smaller there yet. And this is all with respect to North America plate. So the, uh, what that means, yes, the, these other faults are, are taking up some of the motion, but the detail of it turns out to be important. If the faults were slipping and not building up stress, then we would see a sudden change in the length of the arrows at the fault. But it turns out that we don't. What we see is a gradual change in a long distance near the fault. This is the Enriquillo Fault, and this is the one up north, the Septentriano Fault. And from that, you can conclude that it's like stretching a rubber band more and more and more, and it hasn't broken yet. So the conclusion that Eric Calais and his co-authors on this made in 2008 was that the Enriquillo Fault was ready to produce an earthquake of magnitude 7.2 at any time in the near future. And they thought the Septentriano Fault was even more ready to produce an earthquake at least as large and maybe a little bit larger. So to Eric Calais, a scientist at Purdue, the only surprise when the earthquake happened is that in fact it was this one and not that one. He expected the one in Dominican Republic to be first because it was building up at a greater rate than the one in, in, in southern Haiti. And he didn't stop with just publishing this in scientific literature. He actually went to the government agencies and explained it to them. He held conferences, he had workshops, and he met with them. And you can read that, but basically what it says is he went to the government people in 2008 and early 2009 to tell them about this danger. They believed him. He's very persuasive. He speaks French, and French is the appropriate language to speak in Haiti. And they understood it, but basically they said, what can we do? We're a poor country. We're busy trying to keep our people from starving. There's nothing we can do about earthquakes that we don't know when they're going to happen. They did believe him, like I said, and in fact, this report was written in 2009 by the Ministry of the Environment, and they say that, in fact, seismic hazard is very important, and they, they were aware of it, but there was not much they could do given the poverty in the country and the timing they had. So let's take a look at some of the details of Haitian construction and so on. Here you see typical buildings sort of built on top of each other on a steep hill, the cement that they use the way it's constructed, all of this is spelling disaster for earthquakes, the design of it. Any earthquake engineer type person would look at that and say this is bad stuff. And then you look at how it's built on steep slopes and any geological engineer would likewise say, oh man, this is no good at all. And by the way, uh, you know, I just came down on the train from, from Seattle and I saw many places they looked nicer than this. They were certainly a lot more expensive than this, but they were in equally hazardous locations as this. So, Another problem in Haiti was the, the population growing so rapidly in recent years and deforestation in the mountains. So the deforestation in the mountains caused large amounts of erosion. Well, the erosion results in large buildup of deltas where the rivers come out into the ocean, or in this case, the bay. And so this land here is all new land and the settlement that's on it is all new settlements, essentially squatters moving there, living in, in poverty, in, in, uh, in horrible ghetto-type conditions, very densely packed. But this is a terrible place to build any sort of structure. It's much like jello. It starts shaking a little bit, and the jello will shake even more. And this didn't exist before because the deforestation hadn't occurred, that delta wasn't there. So the increase in population has been moving people into areas which are greater risk than other areas had been where they'd lived traditionally in the past. Let's take a look at Japan now for a moment. Japan has a stronger culture of earthquakes. They have more earthquakes, the people know about it. They had a stronger written record, a longer written record. 
and they had things like this. This looks like a tombstone, but it isn't a tombstone. It's a stone that's up in the hills in the area where the large earthquake happened a year ago, almost exactly a year ago now. And the inscription on that basically says, do not build below this point. So there was historic record that tsunamis could come that high. Uh, people started to not pay attention to that, but the people back then were smart enough to say, let's put this here, because who knows if the next uh, person in charge of the community is going to, to be paying attention to this or not. Now, another problem that happened, and it tricked all the seismologists, it tri tricked all of us. Um, here you see in the red dots the aftershocks of the large earthquake a year ago, but you see those oval patterns. Those oval patterns are um, the rupture areas of large earthquakes that have happened in the past that are well studied. We really know more or less where they occurred. And what that's telling us is that as far as we could tell, those earthquakes never got very big. They were always, I mean, the magnitude eight or so, that's still pretty big, but they were never magnitude nine. So people got lulled into a sense of complacency, saying this part of Japan will just simply experience earthquakes of up to about magnitude eight or so. And, and so the tsunamis that would be generated from those will be appropriate for a magnitude eight earthquake, not a magnitude nine. I remember this is a logarithmic scale, so a nine is larger by 10 times in amplitude and much more in energy than in amplitude as well. So um, there were some studies being done just recently. Look at this, 2010. And this study is saying that there's a slip deficit from looking at the earthquake activity and so on. They said, the plate is moving toward Japan, but it's not moving real fast right there because there haven't been enough earthquakes. So that zone there is essentially due for a lot of slip, which means a whopping big earthquake or a zillion smaller earthquakes. And in fact, that is the area where the slip occurred. So it was beginning to be understood, but not in time to do anything about it. This scientist in Japan was bringing this awareness to the people and to the power plants and to the nuclear power plants and to the government. And he was pointing out that there seemed to be the potential in the area for an earthquake as large as one that he had been studying that occurred in 869, not 1869, 869. That 869 earthquake appeared to be so big, actually, it was about the size of the one that just occurred a year ago. And he was trying to warn people about that. But he really only started in August of 2010, just too late to get anything done about it. For a while, people were kind of thinking he was a flake, too, but now they don't think he's a flake. He had it right. So these people in Haiti, they weren't expecting the earthquake. The buildings were not built properly. In Japan, they weren't expecting an earthquake of this size. And what happens? Well, when the earth moves, nothing's the same after that. Let me tell you from personal experience as well as just academic thinking about it. So the Haiti earthquake, it occurred at the time that you see there, and a seismogram be recorded, say, at my office in Michigan Tech, but this is speeded up many times faster. <clears throat> All those waves occur essentially at the same time at the location of the earthquake, and the shaking can be absolutely tremendous. Sometimes you get told, oh, if an earthquake happens, run to a doorway or something. Yeah, forget it. You can't run. It's like saying, when you get in a canoe and you're starting to go over the rapids, switch to the back of the, what, you can't switch to the back of the canoe. <laughs> it's much like that. The best you could do is roll to someplace safe. And I'm not sure where I would roll here. <laughs> let's, hope, let's hope we get through the evening all right. So um, anyway, we have that. So what happened in Haiti? Well, these pictures that we looked at before, this is the after pictures. So we see that buildings collapsed, they fell down on top of each other. The, the buildings that are on the steep hillside, it's like a domino effect. They're crushing each other. And this is cement buildings. Uh, you can imagine anybody inside there, it's very, very unlikely to survive this sort of thing. So on the order of 220 to 300,000 people died within minutes in Haiti there at that time. Just a huge number and the construction and locations of buildings was largely to blame. Now, I've got an interesting little display here. This happens to be uh, for the Japan earthquake. What this is going to show is the growth of that earthquake. It's just an interesting thing. For the, it makes nothing about the rest of the talk, but the earthquake starts in one place, and then it spreads from there. 
and then the Japan earthquake. It first spread in one direction, then spread in the other direction. And scientists are able to work that out now. Uh, and there we see it started out going to the north a bit, and then it spread down to the south before it finally finished out. Uh, we can tell this from seismograph stations around the world that are densely packed so that we can back project to those areas. So um, in, in Haiti, that happened very quickly. And it happened from the point nearest Port-au-Prince and ruptured away from there. Thank goodness. All the damage that was done in Port-au-Prince, that earthquake wasn't closer yet, because it could have been. Now, most of us seismologists are actually quite worried that the next one will be closer, because that fault still exists. It has not been ruptured recently. In fact, it's probably under greater stress now than it was in the past. So the earthquake happens, and we enter the relief or response phase immediately. What does that mean? Some people in the audience are from Mercy Corps. You know exactly well what it means, but I'll go through that a little bit for the rest of us here. Um, the immediate response, first of all, typically what happens is USAID, the Agency for International Development, sends in a DART team. Now, DART team is redundant because the T stands for team. It's disaster, um, yeah, disaster assistance response team. <clears throat> Now, uh, that team is known, recognized worldwide as really the crackerjack people to come in and evaluate quickly the scope of the hazard. Now, uh, these people happen to be centered in Costa Rica. They chartered a plane, came in, landed at the airport where complete destruction was. The airport wasn't operating, but somehow they bribed the pilot. I don't know how they did it. They landed, tried to figure out what's going on, and they're communicating back then to the home office and to the rest of the world. The rest of the world in the disaster community is waiting to hear what the DART team says. And they, they explained what's up, which was, oh my God, basically. And with more detail than that. How much water do they need? How many tents do they need? They're getting an order of magnitude of what the problems are. Of course, in Haiti, everything was a big problem then. So the timeline that we see here is kind of interesting. There's a lot of detail on there, but I'm going to try to concentrate on just the first few days. First, the earthquake happened. It happened late in the day. Uh, and then the DART team comes in, and SAR. Now, as some of you might think, uh, synthetic aperture radar. No, actually, we'll see some of that later, but there's a search and rescue. Then you might think, ah, we live near the mountains here. Search and rescue means you're going around looking with dogs and stuff for the guy that's lost. No, nope. this is urban search and rescue, which is very different. It takes a highly specialized team to be able to do this, and highly specialized teams that are trained in operating in international environments. Uh, it's, a, it's a strange sort of thing, but there, there are crackerjack teams of that around the world, two in the United States, one in Fairfax, Virginia, one in Los Angeles County. Other ones are New Zealand, Japan, you, you guessed it, the other um, Western advanced societies where they have large disasters. And they have good search and rescue, urban search and rescue teams. So the uh, Southcom got involved very quickly. Now this is an unusual sort of thing. It turns out that the army or the military writ large is really the only institution anywhere that has the capacity to do the heavy moving that needs to be done when there's a big disaster like this. Now this often results in sort of conflicts on the ground. First of all, it looks a little bit like we invaded Haiti. Uh, we have done that in the past. <laughs> it, wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't what we meant to do this time, but it smells a little bit bad sometimes to do something like that. But the agreement was in place. We came in and did it. Of course, they were welcome. But the Army at Southcom in general was the only group capable of doing this sort of thing. And they could get in very quickly. And they had things I saw out there, <clears throat> like a, the control tower for the airport. Well, they have something. I don't know how they got it in there, but it sort of flips up and does in there. They've got a portable control tower for the airport because the main control tower was completely damaged and completely unusable. So they could start bringing in other vehicles, other airplanes. Within days, look at that picture. That was about four days after the earthquake. We had Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, Rajiv Shah over in the corner. He was the, the administrator for USAID. He'd been on the job for three days before the earthquake happened. Boy, did he have a steep learning curve. Um, and we see the president, president of Haiti there. And you can tell, of course, that they're meeting in a tent. But that was within days. They're trying to figure out what to do at that level. Now, the search and rescue is often the most dramatic part of the response phase. It's the part that's on TV. It's the part you see in pictures. It's very photogenic. This is part of a series of pictures. I've only got the one here of rescuing a baby. Very, very famous scenes. But one thing I want to, to point out to you 
In Haiti, I mentioned 220 to 300,000 people died. How many do you think were rescued by search and rescue within, the, say, the first week after the earthquake? 192. That's it. It's, it's amazing. So if you're actually in an earthquake and you're, and you're trapped in a building, yeah, you probably aren't going to be waiting for search and rescue. If you're going to be rescued, it's going to be by your neighbors. Now, I gave this talk once at, uh, in New Mexico, and I said that once, and somebody stood up and said, yes, this happened to me. I was a school teacher in Haiti on a mission type of thing, and the building collapsed on me, and my neighbors rescued me within a half a day. I did lose one leg. Oh, my God. <laughs> I didn't know what to say in response to that. I don't think I've had my jaw drop all the way to the ground during a talk, but that happened. Anyway, so neighbors rescue people there much more than others. Uh, although, of course, we go in and do that, those 192 people, it was extremely valuable to save them, but most of the rescue gets done locally. Here you see some more very good photogenic pictures of how the urban search and rescue works, but let's move on. Pretty soon you've got to supply basic needs. Now here we see people handing out water. Okay, that's important. You've got to have good clean water, you know that. And the point, uh, another point I'm using of this picture is USAID, for example, does not do that itself. There are not USAID employees there handing out water. What USAID and many of the other large aid, aid, organ, aid agencies around the world do is they contract to other organizations, pay them to do it. And other organizations are set up to do this. So in this case, it happens to be a faith-based organization that was already operating in that community, and it was easy for them to, to use their network to distribute the water that was brought in then and distribute Now, while I've got this up, and again, those of you who work in the disaster community understand this, there's a, a dilemma that we face here. <clears throat> Immediately, there's no problem. You distribute water, you provide health services, you provide food, you provide shelter, you provide everything you can. But if you do that too long, what happens? What happens to the people that used to make their living distributing water? The people who had the health clinic set up in the neighborhood. If you come in and provide free health care now, pretty soon they're living with their cousins in Miami because they can't make a living there. They can't compete with the free services. So this is a sort of a push and pull or a yin and yang problem that the health, that the aid groups always face. How can we provide enough aid to help them but not so much that they become chronically dependent on aid. It's a dilemma. And I'll come back to that theme once or twice more during the talk here. Um, here you see water supply at camps being brought in by pipes. It's an interesting thing. Within three weeks of the earthquake in Haiti, more pe people had more access to clean water in Port-au-Prince than they had before the earthquake. But the reason was actually that the aid agencies brought in enough diesel to run the pumps 24 hours a day instead of just having them turn off sometimes. It's amazing. So that helps put it in perspective, though, too, how poor the country was to start with. Uh, there you see a shelter uh, community in the background as well. Um, but again, this isn't the way you want the people to live forever. But if it's as good as their life was before the earthquake, why would they leave? So you can't make the camps too nice. So can you imagine reading in the newspapers that we're purposely keeping the camps crummy? But you have to, because if you make it too attractive, they'll leave their good homes and come to the camps because the camps are nicer. And that was happening in Haiti. People were doing that. The growth of the population in the camps continued for six months after the earthquake because the camps were, in spite of everything you saw on TV, so attractive difficult thing. Hard to, hard to stop making them attractive. Now, civilian military cooperation, I mentioned this before, uh, it has to go on. It is a funny strain though, because the civilians that are in disaster response are usually, no offense to the people in the audience who are in that, aging hippies. <laughs> and how, 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 how friendly are they to the military? So, so I've overstated the aging hippies part, and, and for some of the people I know in the audience, I overstated both the aging and the hippie part, but you get the idea. There's a sort of a personality clash 
between the military and the disaster or humanitarian community. And sometimes that's very difficult. There's a lot of distrust there. And it's difficult to overcome that. And I, I always like to try to work toward overcoming that because I, I see that it's extremely valuable. In this case, you see Rajiv Shah, the agency administrator for AID. You see the president, president and prime minister of Haiti. You see the leader of Southcom and so on, all at the table. Everybody's trying to work together. That's again, civilian military cooperation. Now, civilian military disaster risk reduction, it's always DRR like that. Um, I bring this up just because it's an interesting thing. The military will go through exercises with their civilian counterparts and with military in other countries. Now, the military in Japan is a little different. It's a defense group only. It has no offensive capabilities, as most of you know. But they went through an exercise, and that exercise occurred just months, well, uh, like 12 or 14 months, before the Japan earthquake. So what they were going through an exercise for, though, was to have the Japan military and the US military work together when a disaster occurred, say, in Indonesia or someplace. They didn't know that they were going to be working together immediately in Japan. And so it turns out most of you probably never even heard on the news that the US military and Japanese military worked together after the earthquake and tsunami. You know why? Because it worked so smoothly. And it worked so smoothly because they went through this exercise. They knew how to do it. They knew how to communicate. They knew who, they knew the other power, or the person working from the US side already had met the person working from the Japan side and they could work together well. Shelter, uh, sometimes you see on the news, oh my God, all they're doing is giving the people ropes and tarps. How cruel can we be? It turns out study after study for immediate shelter, that's the best thing you can do. That you might say, why don't we at least give them good tents? Well, give them good tents. The first windstorm come along, you break a couple tent poles, and they're looking for the North Face store or REI. I can tell you there is no North Face store or REI in Port-au-Prince. But there are two-by-fours. There are sticks you can get from trees and stuff. So for things that can be maintained and repaired, and you notice those ladies don't look very upset about having gotten those tarps and, and ropes. They actually work. Initially, they'll end up looking like this. But after a while, they'll have fixed them up and make them a lot better. Uh, but again, you see in the news how horrible that this is all we're doing, giving them tarps and ropes. Food distribution, of course, I had to show a picture that has USAID written large on that. Um, but again, keep in mind, we need to distribute food right away because their entire infrastructure is disrupted. But how long do we do that before we put the local grocery store out of business? Or worse yet, the people who distribute the food to the grocery stores. If we disrupt that system for too long, it'll never rebuild and they'll be dependent on the aid agencies forever. Cash for work sounds like a really good idea, and it is a good idea, but there's actually a little dilemma in there too. And I've heard of places, again and again I hear about these places, different stories from around the world actually. Um, in this case, of course, we need to remove rubble. Let's start paying people to remove rubble, get some of the streets cleared. It turns out that was a bigger problem than they thought because where do you put the rubble? Well, somebody owns the land where you want to put the rubble. They didn't want the rubble put there. Would you want to put your place? No, no, well. So that's a problem. Uh, turns out a big problem there. Uh, but let's take some remoter village, and there's rubble in the uh, irrigation canal, and it should be cleared out. Well, it happens, it often happens, that the people there will not clear it out because they know if they wait, they'll get paid by an aid, <clears throat> they'll get paid by an aid agency to clear it out. So they don't do it themselves, they get even more dependent on the aid agency. It's a very, very delicate, tricky balance to try to maintain. And every disaster and every community is different. It's very difficult to learn from one and apply it to another. There are many groups that come in to provide response after a big earthquake or a big disaster like this. And here we see a group, this happens to be the water group. So, Red Cross, Mercy Corps from here, other groups will come in with various expertise. They may already be on the ground there at the time of the disaster. But then they're all there. How do you coordinate it so they aren't all stepping on each other's toes and completely ignoring some other part of the country where the disaster is? So what they've decided, and it works fairly well, is they have these clusters. So each NGO, each non-governmental organization in the area, will have a representative attend if they're involved with water supply the water cluster. And the word gets out that they're meeting on Tuesdays and Thursdays under the tree behind where Joe's bar used to be or something like that. In this case, it was in a nice tent behind Joe's bar or whatever. Um, and then a different cluster meets at a different place, different time. And they'll send representatives there. And you see how it works here. They say, 
um, okay, we've canvassed this area. This area looks pretty good, but this area over here needs some more work. Who's got people that could work there? And two people raise their hands and say, we can do that, we can do that. Okay, they got them checked there. And what have we heard from other places? And people say, look, we sent some scouts out to this place, and they, oh, man, that town is really desperate. What they need is this and this, but we don't have that. Does anybody else? Doesn't. They'll take care of it that way. It works pretty well. It works very well during the response or relief phase. What happens is that it stays going like that too long, and it eventually becomes, during the recovery phase, how many of you work for companies where you think you have too many committee meetings? It's like that. It gets to be too many committee meetings. So at some point it's got to change, but it's hard to tell when that is. So the scientists and the engineers, what are they doing during this time? Well, the, the earthquake type scientists are trying to figure out those questions there, and the engineers are asking those other questions, and, and they're trying to figure this stuff out <clears throat> because they want to be able to provide advice to the people on the ground. They want to figure out is there greater danger coming up? And in fact, advice was being requested of, from, say, the, the Southcom because they were trying to figure out where should they be setting up their facilities and where should they be putting some of the camps for the internally displaced people. This turned out to be the best map they could use, and I prepared this using PowerPoint. <clears throat> Not very good. I just took where the big faults were, and I put red around them, and I put yellow farther away from that, and I said, these are the hazardous areas. This will have to do until we get a better map, and it was the best map they had for a while. So we need to do something better than that, and we'll see a better map later on that appeared after about six or eight weeks. And in the meantime, Scientists want to go do some reconnaissance. It's a little bit tricky because you can't have scientists in there competing with the humanitarian needs of the people. You know, and scientists can't be in the food line saying, give me some food too, and, I, and that's not right. The scientists should never been there if they're going to do that. So it's hard to get in at the start. And some people will try to come in through diplomatic channels. Some people will try to come in through university or academic channels. Uh, this happens to be the backside of Roger Billum's head. He's a, a researcher at the University of Colorado, and he came in through the Discovery Channel. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> he does this often, and among scientists, some think he's great and some think he's a grandstander. I think he does an excellent service myself. So he, he's got the connections with the TV news crews and stuff, and he comes in. He's got a bit of a Scottish-type accent, so he's very debonair sort of seeming, and he, he's very charismatic on camera. And he worked with getting this helicopter. Now, how could he use a helicopter when the helicopter is needed for humanitarian purposes? Well, they found one that was going out to the end of the peninsula with medicine, and it had room for two more people in, so just the scientist and, a film, and, and the photographer. And it would come back making a sort of a zigzagging route. And so they weren't displacing any humanitarian uh, material for that. But he knows what to look for. Other groups came in after a little while. And they're looking for various things, like um, put some seismographs down and see where are the aftershocks. That'll help pin down where the main shock was and so on. And then they'll, as soon as they can, publish a report on this. And this report came out, well, what's that, um, five weeks after the earthquake. So that's pretty fast for a report. That's pretty good. Uh, the people who do this are experienced, and they know how to get on the ground and get out fast without being in people's way. They noticed right away that not all the buildings failed. And this is a famous pair of pictures across the street from each other. Yeah, big difference. So they start looking at what's the cause of the failure of some buildings and not others. Well, it turns out combination, and you can see some of it here. The rebar they tended to use was smooth. It seems to be the only place in the world where they use smooth rebar. So it doesn't grip the cement very well. The rebar we use is, gripped, is ribbed. And there wasn't enough of it. And they didn't have it wrapped around properly like it should, so it could sort of spread out more than it, and, and it shouldn't do that. So it was easy to crumble. And it turns out that the cement they used was really, really crummy, too. And there's a little video on YouTube you can see of one of the engineers reaching into a wall, pulling out a chunk of cement and crushing it with his hand. And he's not Superman. He's just a regular old guy. Uh, so it was a lot of problems with the construction that caused the buildings to fail, but not all buildings were built that way. The soil would sometimes liquefy, shaking like jello, but then that drives the water out of it and it settles down in a way that shakes a lot, breaks apart into little uh, grooves like this and stuff and, and slumps down a bit. And this was the port area that did that. The early pictures of the port show some of these cranes intact and standing up, 
but within a day or so, they were leaning and falling over. So the, the damage was continuing as time went on in that soft sediment. People were observing this remotely as well, from satellite imagery and high flying over with like U-2s type planes or something like that. And they could be mapping things. You can see the fault very, very nicely there. The fault is highlighted by the black arrow and Port-au-Prince is shown by the colored arrow. And uh, other things were done. This is interesting. Department of Defense, of course, has some fairly high resolution images and they could release some of them, not all. Uh, or they'd be degrading the image to a quality that could be released. But they would be mapping the streets and they could tell from time-lapse imagery, say, as to whether or not things were moving on the streets, and they could tell then whether those streets were completely blocked by rubble or were accessible. And they provided that information to the people who needed to get around on the ground, uh, the re immediate responders and so on. The engineering evaluation picked up shortly after that, not immediately, but here you see a house that was in bad shape, and you see over there on the corner the uh, a red stencil. Now the numbering on it just means what crew it was that did the inspection and the lettering is just an abbreviation for the ministry that, that was in charge of that. But the color is what's important. Red means that's it, this house has to be demolished. That's supposed to be green up there, it was green. I don't know why my camera made it look that color, but that means this house is okay. And then there's a yellow in between. That means if it's repaired soon, you could go back into it. And most of that was done by groups trained by this guy here. That's Kit Miyamoto. He's, he runs a, a firm out of California that does this sort of work, er, work, earthquake engineering. And he just got appointed to be the earthquake engineer for the state of California as well. He trained with his staff, trained enough Haitians to go out and do this. And within three months, they inspected 400,000 buildings. Just amazing. Wow, talk about engineering. Let's get this job done. He and his group did. <clears throat> Now, some of the things that Roger Billum observed when he was on that helicopter flight, first he'd see something like this. I don't know if you can tell what that is there, but that's coral reef that's up above the water. It's, it's exposed under the air. Now, that's not where coral grows. Coral grows down in the water. So obviously the ground had lifted up. This was a surprise. Most of you got the question right on the trivia that it was a transform fault sliding sideways. What the heck is it doing with one side coming up over the other a bit? lifting up the ground. That was a surprise to scientists. Another thing that was a surprise is right where you expected to see the ground break from that fault, and we expected it, it's not there. It should have been right down this valley. We see some landslide scars from the shaking, but that's it. You do not see the fault. So these things were surprises. In addition, you go to satellite imagery, and this is interferometric synthetic aperture radar, and what you see is the difference before and after the earthquake. And that sort of smooth striping indicates that there was deformation that was gentle in the area, not sudden at some location in time. The, earth, the fault itself, if it had ruptured at the surface, you would see a disruption right there instead of smooth contours. That's another indication that it did not rupture the surface. Those were all surprises to people, and they spent some time after that trying to figure out why did this earthquake not behave the way we thought it did initially. I'll come back to that later. The engineers are studying things like the liquefaction in the area where the port is, and some of those don't have to be done immediately, but they do have to be done fairly quickly before the evidence is destroyed. An improved seismic hazard map was made quite quickly then from the U.S. Geological Survey. This was available within about six weeks after the earthquake so that people could start deciding where new settlements should be built up. If any new construction was to take place, where could we do it? It's a little unfortunate that most of the, so the settled part of Haiti is in fact prone to large earthquakes. In fact, it's not just earthquakes that are the hazards. People have to take a look at could there be landslides? Is there a flooding hazard? Is there all these other things that could happen? And it turns out, if you put them together and you make sort of a color scale of hazard degree, the United Nations did this. These are the various agencies that contributed to it. And it's almost the same as a population map of Haiti. It's, what a bum deal those people got, I tell you. They, you know, those are the habitable places. They're also the hazardous places. Now, these are the logistics issues. I've mentioned them before, so I'll go on quickly from that. But scientists have to be careful not to be in the way of the humanitarian efforts there. And if the work that they're doing can wait, it should wait, so that they're not stumbling in the way of the humanitarian efforts. Now, the response finished up 
basically when the search and rescue was done and the, the uh, temporary camps were fully settled and so on. So at some point you migrate from response to recovery. And so there we are moving into recovery and that's where we are now. Uh, and that recovery or reconstruction is perhaps a better term in Haiti is going to go on for a number of years. Things are happening like, uh, this was very quickly done, a uh, brochure sewing showing better ways to rebuild their homes so that they are less likely to fail during large earthquakes. Now, Haiti has a problem. If you want to build a home to withstand earthquakes, it might not be very good to withstand hurricanes. You build it to withstand hurricanes, it might be bad for earthquakes. You got both in Haiti. So it takes a bit more specific type of construction, not using much wood because they don't have much wood there, in order to do it safely. The good news is that we visited a site there where a building was under construction and I happened to be with two earthquake engineers who were some of the top in the world and they were very pleased with the construction that they saw there. They said this is being done properly. Happened to be at the engineering college of the <laughs> country so that <laughs> if it weren't done correctly we'd be really worried. So you see a number of other things going on here as part of the recovery effort. Um, you see buildings being torn down, buildings being built. Um, better uh, sanitary facilities being put into the temporary camps. This is a, an interesting thing. Uh, many of the people in Haiti had never used toilets before. So they had to be taught to use these sorts of facilities. Um, the military stationed in many places, you, you, one of the last things you want is bored soldiers. So you find something for them to do. And they're good at building things, so they built schools. Did they build schools to seismic standards? I'm not quite sure, and we actually have some experts of that in the audience here today. Um, so if in the question and answer period, if they're still sober, you could ask them that stuff. But um, the military is good at this, and so they can quickly put up a building, a school building, if people in the community request it and want it. And health facilities can be provided as well. Um, but again, you have to worry about, are you displacing the indigenous health system? So it turns out that scientific studies of disaster response also get done. Not scientific studies during the disaster or something, but of the response. And, and this is a summary of, of one of the better ones here. Um, it turns out that after a big disaster is the right time to push the agenda of mitigation. Let's rebuild in a way that these next buildings will survive. Let's put in the appropriate types of pipelines so that they can be shut off and not cause big fires and so on. Let's do all that. And, and the right time to be heard is then because it's very difficult, <clears throat> very difficult to be heard otherwise. And I liked, uh, I gave this talk in New York City once in Manhattan and I asked how many of you in the audience voted for Mayor Bloomberg based on his stand on disaster risk reduction? And of course, there's laughter in the audience. No, you can't even think of that. That just makes no, it doesn't register. But it is important. Of course, Mayor Bloomberg will not be in office when the next big disaster hits New York City, probably. So it, it's less important to him, but it's really important to the people. So one point that I like to make is, okay, maybe this politician's in and out or something, but you, you're building a building. How long do you think that building is going to stand there? Chances are that building will be there and people will be in it when the next big earthquake happens. If you think of it that way, we have to have good standards for building. If you think of it more in terms of, well, I don't know if an earthquake can happen next year, why should I build this building really good now? That's the wrong approach. How about the lifetime of the building? Lifetime of the building, chances are it will be there. So the Hogo Framework for Action also said that, said during the post response or the recovery period, emphasize mitigation. So. The time is now to do that in Haiti. And one of the first things that was done was by within two and a half months, a meeting was held, a workshop that brought together scientists, engineers, land use planners, architects, um, uh, two people from the Haitian cabinet uh, and um, other, other people like that from the Haitian government to get together and talk about how to try to institute this in the rebuilding of Haiti. Uh, you do need advocates of this, and here we see a letter that was provided by the Minister of Environment. The Ministry of Environment was very keyed into this stuff. 
it's hard to say up there. Well, you can't read it, but it's, it was sent to the Secretary General of the United Nations, and it's signed by the Minister of Environment of Haiti, by the Assistant Secretary of State of the United States, and by the Special Representative for Disaster Reduction, essentially, of the United Nations. So you get that group together, and it starts to carry some weight. If you can get this sort of thought into the rebuilding process and into the funding agencies, then it can have some teeth. And that's been the effort that's been going on. So one thing that happened, the Haitian government then requested that the United Nations provide them with funding to hire a seismic risk reduction specialist on a year basis. It's turned out now to be two years, but that person is shown in this picture. That's him there. And that's Eric Calais, the, the Purdue scientist who had in 2008 recognized the likelihood of this earthquake and who had tried to get the interest of the government in mitigating against the disaster that would respond. He had the credibility, you know, the, the, they believed him, they liked him, he spoke French fluently, that helps. Um, and so there he is. This woman happens to be the leader of the equivalent of FEMA for uh, Haiti, for the Haitian government. She's the uh, civilian uh, response leader there. And uh, these people are all the heads of the um, uh, civil protection of the various, you could call them provinces, of the country of Haiti. So then Eric Calais formed a, an advisory team to help him. And here you see the advisory team working hard late at night. Now, the first thing you notice is the wine glasses. That's true. But if you look closely, you see laptops open here. Of course, they're working outside. It's not smart to work inside. Um, uh, but there was a, a restaurant there, and we told the waiters to just go home, leave the wine for us, we'll take care of this. And we worked till late in the night preparing the report for them. But that disaster team, if you go around the table here, I won't do that. It's sort of a who's who in disasters and earthquakes and earthquake-resistant design for the world. It's a very efficient, very effective team. Of course, the Haitian government is a different situation, having to deal with that and the elections and stuff. Um, so ongoing efforts, additional reports published, more refined from various points of view, and then a lot of new scientific results coming out of this as well. A special issue of Nature Geoscience, publishing some of these papers now. They're trying to figure out what, that, um, what was that fault that ruptured, because it wasn't exactly what we thought it was. And there are two different models. They're sort of similar, but a little bit different. From our point of view, they look the same, and it's, it's a variation on the theme that we talked about, but it's a complication. And it means we aren't quite sure whether that earthquake actually relieved the stress that we knew was there. Another study that was done uh, explained why the shaking seemed to be worse in places that people were surprised at. And what it is is many of these hillsides were fairly pointed at the top, and like this microphone, the shaking was worse at the top of the hillsides. And uh, that could be ma mapped by putting out seismographs that recorded aftershocks, and they saw that. So studies like that kept on going. Now, likewise in Japan, but Japan had, <coughs> Japan had instrumentation throughout the country. I mean, just look at each of these vectors here. And those are continuously recording the GPS. And you see the motion during the earthquake uh, in, in one direction and in up and down direction as well. Uh, and so there's a huge amount of data available from the Japan earthquake. Now, this slide says conclusion, but it's not the last slide. I'm sorry to trick you here. There is, a, there is a conclusion we can make at this point, though, and it's a good one. And that is that the scientists and engineers need to work together, right? We came to that conclusion, uh, and you see the various aspects of it there. The good news is that, in fact, they're doing that. This is a very bright light that we see happening now. Young scientists, in particular, can't see doing the type of research without involving the local people, without having the social good aspect of their research be an important part. An unfortunate thing is that the tenure system in the universities in America did not yet incorporate that. I'm the chair of a department. I advise my younger scientists, faculty, get tenure first, then do this stuff. You can't do it the other way around. I hope that by the time they are chairs and they're advising younger faculty, they don't have to say that. But right now, that's still true. Any of you who are in positions of influencing that, help influence that. Okay, the next stage in this talk, let's look at the big picture here. 
we mentioned earlier that earthquakes seem to be occurring more often right now. Certainly they're occurring in areas where they cause more damage than they used to. That's perhaps because people are living in areas where they didn't used to and they're exposed to greater hazard. But this is a nice timeline showing earthquake magnitudes as a function of time, starting in 1900. Notice that the scale starts at 7.5, so Haiti isn't even on this. It's too small to be shown on this diagram. And you notice that there's a period without much activity. There's a period with a lot of activity. Then there's a period of not much at all, and then there's a period of a lot. What you see in front of you is all the data that the scientists have as well. And from that, you can draw a conclusion. Well, which conclusion are you going to draw? Is it random or is it periodic? Yes. <laughs> That's good. Right. So you can slice it and dice it any way you want. And the scientists do that, and they come up with differing conclusions as well. My view, personally, is it's random. But some people say it's periodic. It's periodic in a way that I'll bet the next earthquake's going to make it different. And they can't, anyway. So <laughs> we'll, we'll leave that at that. So here we go to the mainland US. And here we see a seismic hazard map for the United States. And you see some things there that are, yeah, good. It's nice to live in a bright, hot, colored area, isn't it? <laughs> that's, that's where I live. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been through hundreds, probably thousands of earthquakes. I've had my fill. Thank you. I don't want one here tonight either. Um, my hazard there, though, of course, is snow and ice and cold. But I'll take that. But let's turn our attention to the Pacific Northwest. We might as well do that. That's where you live here. And let's look at, first of all, you, you saw earlier a juxtaposition. I don't have a slide that quite does that, comparing the Japan earthquake with the potential for an earthquake offshore here. If you take Japan and look at the subduction zone there, frankly, it's like looking in a mirror. It's just a flip version of what you've got offshore here. Exactly. The only difference is the rate at which the earthquakes occur. Otherwise, the potential for a big earthquake is there. It's got just the right geometry. So we see that here. We see the details of the plates there, and we see the subduction zone there. And if I had the map of Japan, it would be just about the same size, just flipped around, looking in a mirror. And here you see a cross-section through the area, and you see a history of some earthquakes in the area. And um, there was this one here in 2001, a uh, Seattle earthquake, um, <clears throat> reasonably good size, scared the daylights out of people. Um, and then there's one that was probably a very long time ago, and we've already mentioned the one around 1700. So those are the years of the major earthquakes. So is there a possibility of a big earthquake rupturing this entire area here, like we think perhaps the 1700 one did? Well, how do we know this sort of stuff? How do we know that there was an earthquake in 1700? Well, here's a geologic column, and that geologic column has some layers of sand in there. And those layers of sand, you know what they're from? They're from that liquefaction and the sand eruption, just like we saw in the video from Japan. So you can map those, you can time them, you can try to correlate them from one place to another, you can get rid of the spurious stuff that happened to occur at just one location from some other reason, a little local landslide or something, because if they correlate from one place to another, there was a big earthquake that did that. So this shows the frequency of events. It might be hard to see, but this is 1500 BC, 1500, 0, 500, 1000, 1500, modern day at the end there. And you can see when they think the earthquakes occurred, and then the land uplift, and the earthquake occurred, and, then, and so on there. And let me ask you, you saw on the trivia question, the recurrence time for earthquakes in Cascadia. What was the answer, 240? Do you think that's right? Or do you think it's random? I think it's random. I think we do ourselves a disservice by talking about recurrence times, because we sort of think, well, it's not due yet, or it's overdue. Nah, it's random more or less random. So are we due for one now? I don't know. <laughs> it's capable of generating a big one right now. It's capable of generating one like that. But how about that one in 1700? There was some indication here of that one in 1700 off there. And um, 
there was a lot of work done. Now, maybe some of you have seen talks on this subject here in the past, because the person who did this is, uh, speaks well and is around sometimes doing this, giving these talks. Is he in the audience? <laughs> anyway. Okay, he did. So that's Brian Atwater. He did give a science pub a couple of years ago, but I don't think you were awake. Or, no, no, no. So you weren't old enough to drink then. That's why you weren't here. So um, what it was is there was a tsunami in Japan. In Japan, they know that an earthquake occurs, a tsunami will follow after that. And they were really good at keeping records. But there was this one tsunami that had no earthquake. So they called it the orphan tsunami. And it turned out that you put together the um, earthquake record here, and there's one that was probably around 1700, and it matches the tsunami in Japan. So Brian Atwater found that, figured that out basically. And there's this, sorry, there should be a little strip along the side, it's sort of cut off, but it gives the USGS professional paper number for this. I don't know how he got permission to write a USGS professional paper that reads like a mystery novel but it's worth doing. So if you just Google USGS professional paper orphan tsunami, you'll find that and it's worth doing. So that's how they figured out, combining the information from Japan with the information here, and they did it. So that concludes my talk. I wanna thank you and thank all of these groups that helped me make this talk possible, and I appreciate being here.